True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to my interview with Gerard Labaskachny, who is, among many other things, the author of the new book, The Profiler Diaries, from the case files of a police psychologist. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporter for the week, a huge thank you goes out to Chanel Duplessis for her support on Patreon. Thank you so much. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. We also have two new ways that you can support the show. You can head over to Audible and purchase the Krugersdorp Cult Killings by Jana Marx, which I narrated, or you can get your health and beauty needs from King Online and get a 10% discount by using the code TCSA10 at checkout. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to help keep the show growing and improving. If you've been listening to True Crime South Africa for a while, I don't have to tell you that today's interview was a serious bucket list moment for me. I've wanted to interview Gerard Labaskachny on the podcast for a while, and when I saw that he was getting ready to publish his first book, I could not pass up the opportunity to interview him about it and his work. Gerard Labaskachny has been a clinical psychologist since 1998. After qualifying, he went to work at Vescorpi's psychiatric hospital and was a lecturer at the University of Pretoria. In 2001, Gerard joined the South African Police Service as the section head of the Investigative Psychology Section. He worked in this position for 14 years until resigning on the rank of brigadier in 2016. Besides being a clinical psychologist with the Health Professions Council of South Africa, as well as the British Psychological Society, Gerard is also a criminologist. He's a member of several international research organisations and has attended training courses held by the FBI, Ontario Provincial Police and several other international and local agencies. In his career, Gerard has profiled and worked on hundreds of psychologically motivated criminal cases. He is without a doubt one of the most highly qualified and knowledgeable voices in the South African true crime community. Of course, the minutes Gerard resigned from the SAPS, everyone wanted to know when he was going to write a book. And although it may have taken him five years to get to the point of doing it, it was certainly well worth the wait. The Profiler Diaries, from the case files of a police psychologist, was published by Penguin Random House, South Africa, in March 2021. It is impeccably written, beautifully honest, and at times unexpectedly hilarious. I don't think that many people realise how much goes into writing a book like this. Of course, for someone like Gerard, they're not just writing a book. They are putting deeply personal and sometimes harrowing experiences into words. And that's something I like to keep in mind when I'm reading these books, including The Profiler Diaries. Although I may devour a book in less than a day, I know that a huge amount of blood, sweat and tears has gone into that work. And I am grateful to Gerard and every other author like him for having the courage to put their experiences down on paper for us to share in. 
You'll hear me mention things that I liked about the book throughout the interview. But if you're looking for a review, it's simple. Five stars, and there was literally nothing I didn't like about it. Except maybe that it had an ending. Just like I could have continued reading about Gerard's experiences forever, I could have interviewed him for hours and never run out of questions to ask. If you follow the show on social media, you would have had the opportunity to submit the one question you would ask Gerard if you were stuck in an elevator with him. I managed to get three listener questions in, so listen out at the end of the interview to find out if your question was one of them. And now, without further ado, here's my interview with Gerard Labaskachny. Gerard, in your book, you say you can visit the depths of hell, just don't hang around there for too long. Love that quote, by the way. Do you think that there is a limited career span in this line of work from a mental health perspective? Or is it less about the things you experience and more about the conditions you work under? I think it's a combination of the kind of person. I think you have to have the right kind of people that have perhaps an inherent ability to manage this type of stuff. That's the first thing. And we saw that, you know, we had some people that would come and stay with us for six months and then resign. And I think it's better that people do that if that this might not be really what they're fascinated by. Because if you're not fascinated by it, you're just going to be hit with this goriness in, in front of you. So I think it starts with that, getting the right people who have the right mindset for it. I do think to work on this full time for you know 30 40 years like in a law enforcement environment and as busy as we were in ip ips sure i you know i think that is a that is a very strong psychological toll and i mean there are people i mean elmery has been there since uh, was it 1995 and she's still there you know so she's probably the longest serving active law enforcement profiler that i know of because partly because in the us and other parts of the world you, your active duty is basically 20 years and then you full retirement after 20 years. That's typically in the US, for example. And then a lot of guys, of course, go do it privately afterwards, but that's quite different privately because you, you often you're working for yourself as it's your own pace. You can turn down cases, whereas in the police, you know, you don't have the choice of turning down cases. Uh, and I think the frustration of the law enforcement environment is it's, it's a difficult environment. You have admins, nonsense. You have the, the typical internal politics of working in a big organization, which for me was often the most frustrating thing. So I think, you know, limited lifespan, I would say if you're in, a, in, in law enforcement, because I just think that it's just ongoing and never ending with its frustrations. I think if you do it and then you leave and go do it privately, which isn't really possible in South Africa, I don't really think. Again, you have that selectivity about being able to do it. You can pace yourself. You can focus on the other nice things in life instead of like when I was working there, where literally you're working 24 hours a day because you're always thinking about something. You come home, you work until till two in the morning because you have to have a report ready the next day. And it's just sort of a never ending cycle, which can be kind of destroying. So, and I think it again, depends on how do you balance yourself? You know, if you just focus on this and you don't focus on your health and family and friends and doing things that are nice, then it is you only start to see the terrible side of the world, which is not a good setup. Okay. So I guess it's really a pretty individual thing and a personal approach to how you handle it. So having read the book, I cannot ignore the irony of your high school guidance teacher having been convicted of murder. Yeah, it was, uh, I must say, um, I wouldn't say I'm not surprised, but <laughs> um, no, it's, I mean, that's a bit of tongue in cheek. Yeah, I mean, it was just you know, how the little twists and turns of life and how people end up. I mean, I think he had started up a business doing garden service and got into an argument with one of his clients and apparently got very heated and he went and got his firearm from his car and he shot the client. Uh, yeah, but it's just, you know, it's one of those things as you, you kind of think life is stranger than fiction. As you laid out your path to your work in psychology in the book, I couldn't help but think that if everything wasn't perfectly in place the way that it was, you may never have made it to the IPS, and the world would certainly have been poorer for it. And we actually have your mom to thank for the Gerard Labaskachny we know today. Yeah, well, firstly for giving birth to me, I do appreciate that she did that. Um, 
Um, but yeah, you know, I do often sit back and look at things that have happened to me in my life. And I, and I really do regard myself as having been a very fortunate, for various reasons, being born into a family that could afford to, you know, by both my parents, they were always supportive. They could afford to put me in a decent school. They could afford to put me through a university education, which a lot of people in the world in our country don't have that. So I do, you know, I, I never ignore the privilege that I've had. But yeah, I do think that often I look back and I think, wow, some, sometimes I think there's, whether you want to call it God or karma or something, looking out for me because some things have just kind of fallen into place. And I think me getting into this field of work was one of them. You know, the good fortune I had in my career, um, you know, how, how people were kind to me and supportive. I do really kind of think, wow, that was, you know, you, you were blessed by somebody and it's things just seem to have fallen into place. And I mean, I suppose also if you bring in the right attitude and put in the effort that helps things fall into place, uh, I always say, for example, in an investigation, it's, it's surprising how hard, the more harder you work, the luckier you are. So I do think it's, you know, if you're a useless bugger who's not doing anything, I don't think any good like that's going to happen to you. But I think if you are, your head's in the right space, you're focused, you're, you know, you're doing a good, honest job. I do think the universe to some degree hopefully looks after you. And I found it really interesting that you got into psychology based on an experiment the university was doing around admissions in which you showed an aptitude for the subject as opposed to the ordinary submission criteria of matric results. Yeah, I mean, my matric results are, were abysmal, I would say the least. Um, I think I mentioned them in the book. It was really shocking. People often think, oh, you must have been like the, the, the top scholar in your class. I'm like, no, I was probably more close to the bottom. And I just, I don't think it was a lack of intelligence. I just think my mind and my brain didn't fit school and I didn't know how to study. And I fortunately, after leaving school, when I went to study, I, I did study something I was enjoy, I enjoyed and I started to apply um, a study method that worked for me and it, things kind of just took off from there. But yes, I mean, I do think it's, we often, you know, I, I, I agree. We all have aptitudes for certain things and that's, that, that's got nothing to do with IQ. I mean, I might have the IQ to be an accountant, but I tell you, I'd be a, t- a horrible de- accountant, start firstly, uh, and I'd be the most unhappy accountant on the planet. So I think it was a, a very interesting, I'd love to know the actual overall outcome of that study, that, you know, do you judge people on how they can remember and write down answers in a test? Is that the best measure of who they are and what they can do, or the inherent aptitudes they have for certain fields or issues or topics? And I do think that, uh, yeah, but I am very grateful that, I, again, you know, was I lucky? Um, how, you know, was that particular year, uh, was my year that I, you know, I have, you know, signed up and went to this thing. So again, lucky in my misfortune of not doing well at school. And now, as I said, I mean, I've got I think, six degrees and, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I think people just can't, my family sometimes can't believe it where I, where I sit today with qualifications compared to where I was at the end of matric. Measuring people by their performance in school is something that I've never quite understood for the most part. And I think the fact that we have this example of someone who, by their own account, did not perform well in school, but was able to qualify into the field he's in through aptitude, should be a major wake-up call for us. Gerard may not have fit the standard academic school mould, but he's gone on to do life-changing work in a field he showed an aptitude for. You make a comment in the book about how serial murderers actually spend a very small amount of time committing their crimes, and that we should keep that in mind when we wonder how no one close to them knew what they were up to. The way you structured that comment really hit home for me, because these really are just ordinary human beings about 98% of the time, and our expectation, I think, is very different. Yeah, and I think that's partly fueled by TV and movies, you know, that want to create this monster of a person who is permanently scheming to, you know, kidnap someone and slice their skin off type of thing. And yeah, and I do think this is what people, why people are so afraid, because it's the person you least expected. You know, it would be great if they were all living this criminal lifestyle of robbing and scheming and committing fraud and cheating on people and being mean and rude. That would make things great. (laughs) We could identify them. But like I say in the book, I mean, even you take the quarry mur- serial murder who has killed 16 people, let's say, you know, let's give them two hours for each murder, you know, to actually go out there, find the victim, commit the murder. That's, you know, 32 hours. It's not a work week in, in South Africa, at least. So what are they doing for the rest of the time? You know, they've got to apply for their licenses. They get irritated. They get cut off by a taxi and get angry. And, 
you know, get hungry, they have to go to the toilet, they get sick, you know. So they're doing the things that we all can relate to 99 or 98% of the time. They're not normal, of course, because they go out and do things that the rest of us don't. But in that way, they're much more easy to relate to as people when you sit down and actually meet them. Um, once you move off the topic of what they did, um, they've got anxieties, happy things that make them happy, things that make them frustrated, like, like as I said, all of us do. I was also fascinated by the fact that so many of the offenders you interacted with had your cell phone number, and you actually seemed to build pretty solid relationships with them, to the point that some were sending you cards well after your departure from the IPS. Is that something you would recommend to others in this line of work, or is it just something that worked for you? I guess it's about building trust. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I wouldn't say it's many. It was a handful, a very small handful for sure. Uh, and it just kind of turned out that way. You know, one was a guy that who had been part of my research originally, my master's in doctoral research, that I that he had my contact numbers. And then I would, you know, when in the police, go back and see him from time to time. Uh, obviously, when I was in the police, it was easy to get access to offenders in the prisons. For various reasons, I'd go back and see him and, and just would give him my number. Um, the, the other one was the, the Norwood serial murderer who then would phone me every now and then. And again, I think it's because I saw him for a parole hearing when he was uh, his first parole hearing that he was coming up for a couple of years ago. And I, I gave him my contact number. That, that at the time was my police contact number. So I, I didn't, you know, I felt a bit safe that it was not my private one. And then I think it was just really one or two other guys. I think a stalker that I once actually was the investigating officer of his case and after the arrest and stuff. And he was, just, he was quite a nice guy. Um, and that was more that I can get hold of him uh, to make sure he's going to, you know, rock up for his um, court appearances. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it as a standard procedure. And I definitely have not, not done that as a tactic to sort of build up friendships. Because, I mean, you have to remember that these are, you know, for the most part, these, if I'm speaking to someone, they've done very, very horrible and unusual things. And I definitely wouldn't want to make it easy for a lot of them to find out where I stay, that's for sure. And the poor lady that ended up inheriting your old SAPS cell number after you left... Why don't I ever get recycled a profiler's number? I'll just get Mr. Peter Sir that owes Edgar's 450 rand. How did you find out about that? I think, so obviously it was my police cell number and uh, you know, I left, I obviously had to hand that phone back. And one would, I would have thought they would have given it to one of my colleagues in the unit who didn't have a police cell phone or at least to the head of the unit, which would have made the most sense or the acting head. And they just clearly didn't. And the number lapsed and it gets you know put back into circulation by Vodacom and this Poor lady. I mean, it was anything from drunk policemen at two in the morning phoning to probably the weirdest SMSs to, again, every now and then an offender like Khaldnes uh, that I mentioned now, <laughs> my number could even be phoning. And it's a shame. I just think the drunk policeman would be bad enough for her to get these calls at the, <laughs> two o'clock in the morning um, from horribly drunk people, you know. Um, so I think eventually, you know, she must have said to one of these people, I keep on getting phone calls from for this guy and I don't know what's going on. And I think they, they explained to her and then they obviously, you know, got hold of my new number or phoned someone else in the unit and said, listen, you know, you know that Gerard's old number has been recycled into some poor, poor lady um, out there. So I, I hope those are calls have ended. It's been a couple of years since I've left. And I think they did actually then give her the, the, re, the current head of the units or the, the then head of the units, the new, new number that they, those people could you know, contact the unit. I really feel for this lady. I listened to a podcast once about a journalist that was in the process of interviewing Charles Manson, and he gave the man his home number. Manson was, of course, a highly manipulative, a highly manipulative person, and loved having control over someone on the outside. So he would calculate time differences and phone this journalist at midnight on his home phone. After the fifth time of his girlfriend being woken up at midnight to hear, hey, it's Charlie Manson. If I'm not mistaken, she decided that relationship was not for her. Anyway, back to the interview. Gerard, you mentioned that you chose to do your internship at one military hospital, as the psychologists there were less fixed on the psychodynamic theory of psychology. And that's something that I think is important to talk about, because I don't think a lot of people realize that there are actually different schools of thought around psychology. I think a lot of what the public is exposed to in terms of serial offense psychology is based on the psychodynamic school of thought, where it always comes back to the mother, 
Their crimes are seen to reflect the period of their development in which they experience trauma, etc. But that isn't the only way to view the psychology of these offenders, and perhaps not even the most accurate. Could you maybe give us a brief explanation of the system theory that you lean toward? You know, so obviously, like many people, you when I was growing up, I kind of you think of psychology and you think of Freud. That's really kind of, I suppose he was, you could say, the godfather or grandfather of psychology and as we know it today, and really had a massive impact on psychologists. And I mean, so so when we talk about psychodynamic, we're really talking about you know theories that kind of emanated from Freud's way of looking at things that you know everything that's happened to you in your first five years of life are really what determines how you're going to behave and the Oedipus complex and the Electra complex and those types of things. Uh, and that has permeated sort of general conversation about psychology in the world. But there are lots of different theories. And, and even myself, I was thinking, I'm, that's the way I'm going to go until in my later years of study, my honors and my masters, I was exposed to other theories like behaviorism, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, systems theory. And I found the system, systems one or systemic thinking, the one you mentioned now, the one that really just made the most sense to me when I heard about it. And that's that we don't, we don't live in isolation. We, first of all, it starts off by saying in a nutshell, this is not the best, um, this is not a lecture on systems theory. In a nutshell saying, you know what, we, how will we ever know whether or not something in the past is responsible for how you are today and who you are today? And even if it is, we can't go back and change that. So what they rather say is, what is the impact of you in a system? We all live in systems, whether it's a family system, your mother and the father, uh, and you're the child, or you're the parent with the wife and kids, or in a work system where you're one part of the big work cog of, of machinery, um, to various relationships, they're all systems. And how sometimes a person's behavior serves a particular purpose. And the one we often like to sort of give an example of, which perhaps many people could relate to, is if you have, for example, an, an alcoholic parent. Let's say it's the father just for argument's sake. And you might have a son who's, you know, of the father who is now, say, 15, 16. And what often happens is, for example, with the alcoholic father, he starts to not really function as a father anymore because of the, of the drinking. And the son often becomes, in a way, a father figure to the other siblings, maybe. Um, the more, you know, becomes the parentified child, if you want to use that terminology, um, maybe even in some ways becomes a substitute husband for the wife in terms of helping out with the kids. I'm not talking about anything in a, in a sexual way. And now the system then adapts to that. Now, what happens if dad suddenly wakes up one day and he decides I'm going to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I really want to change. And he does. Is he going to easily just walk back into that role of being the dad or is the system going to say, but hang on a minute, you can't suddenly tell us, you know, sit up straight, don't come home after 10, because, you know, where have you been? You haven't been that in that father role. Um, and trying to get back into that role, the system almost doesn't allow you because the system has changed around you. So we often say that sometimes the system keeps the symptom alive, in that example I've given you now, or sometimes the symptom has a function. So let's say, again, you have parents that are fighting for whatever reason on a regular basis. And you might find a child develops a particular physical symptom, psychological symptom. And the effect of that is whenever the parents fight, the child's symptom becomes prominent and the fighting stops because the parents focus on the child. Now, whether or not, I'm not saying that child has faked the symptom to try and stop his parents fighting, but what the, what's on some, um, we want to use the term unconscious level just for, for, for convenience sake, that starts to serve a role. Whether the child realizes it or not, it is a way to break that cycle of the parents fighting. So there, that symptom suddenly becomes an important thing of stopping the parents fighting. Now, that's a really crash course. I'm, I'm definitely, there's better ways to explain it than I have now. But, and I kind of found that I think the idea of that we operate in a context, that context influences us and, we, and um, can sometimes make us behave in a way that we don't want to, but it serves us a, a purpose for the bigger system. Um, and that can cut. And if you don't look at the system itself, can you really understand where that person is? And also, basically, like I said, we don't know what really originates the problem. They kind of say we don't know what originates problems, but let's just look at how that symptom is playing out in the current system and what function it serves in the current system. One of the reasons that I think it's important for us as members of the public to understand all of these different approaches to psychology is because it helps us to better understand ourselves. We have this desperate need to understand why people do some of the horrendous things they do or have these things done to them. And really, that's a large part of the roots of true crime as a genre. But if we're just accepting one viewpoint on the why and not digging a little deeper and looking at different perspectives, perhaps we're actually just trying to confirm 
that we are indeed vastly different from both criminals and victims, and therefore this could never happen to us. When the truth is, if you really want to know how different these people are from you, the answer is not a whole lot different. Back to the interview. Something else that I found very interesting that you mentioned about the psychiatric and psychological assessments that offenders have before their trials, which is to determine competency and if any mental health aspects could have contributed toward their crime, is that a panel of professionals assessing the accused can only report on what the court asks them to report on. So very often, the public is so keen to hear what an accused's mental health assessment tells them, but really it seems that even if something major is found, if it doesn't impact any of the court's criteria, it won't be included in the report. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very understandable that the courts and society would like to know, but what's wrong with this person who's committed, for example, a family murder or a serial murder or whatever. But the only kind of forensic assessment that is done in terms of the court proceedings is that one to determine, can this person be put on trial right now? In other words, are they mentally in a position to stand trial? Can they speak to their lawyer or are they hearing voices? Because Can they put up a fair defense and work with their lawyer? And then, of course, the second part is at the time of the incident, was there something affecting their mental status that influenced them to behave that way at that time? Um, And that's a very narrow focus of what we're asked to look at. So we often expect, and even prosecutors expect, they're going to get sometimes with this lengthy, great insights as to who is this person? You know, what's their psychological makeup? What makes them tick? What made them commit the act? And that's not what this is for. And often there's a sort of perhaps in the community or um, in in the court, this feeling of we want something more. And that's the problem. There's no mechanism in our legal system where that can be done by, for example, a state psychologist or psychiatrist. So we used to sort of do some of that um, to some degree in the unit uh, because we saw there was a bit of a gap. But of course, we weren't doing that for every single case in the country where it could have been done. We would do it for sort of our own particular cases. And, you know, there's a lot of information specifically when it comes to the sentencing of that individual, which is incredibly important. You know, if you're a psychopath, for example, that is not something that, that affects those two issues that I mentioned now the court has to look at. Uh, it doesn't affect your ability to stand trial. It doesn't affect your, your ability to determine right from wrong at the time of the crime. But it's massively important for when it comes to sentencing of this person. They might have picked it up. It might not even be mentioned in their report because it doesn't reflect those two questions, those two issues. Therefore, it's never mentioned later on when it comes to sentencing, because there's no state mechanism, for example, to do a second assessment for sentencing purposes. Uh, So the defense might call their psychologist to come and give evidence, but you usually find they're only going to call someone that's speaking in a way that's beneficial to their client. You know, very rarely, I've had it a few times, but very rarely are they going to call someone who's going to say, yep, my lord, this guy is a real psychopath who (laughs) is a big, big, huge danger to society. They're probably not going to call that psychologist. And this is quite a scary thought for me as a member of the public. If the court isn't actually getting the full picture when it comes to sentencing, is this something that should be addressed? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, we really need to have the courts at that. It doesn't help, you know, you get a great conviction. Yeah, we convicted this guy on a murder and whatever else. But then the court isn't made aware of their danger. Or even if you convict some, say, on a, a lesser crime in the sense of something less than murder is a lesser crime, Let's say, for example, a child molester who's convicted of one event, uh, of molesting or two events of molesting a ch- a children, which again is horrific on its own right. But if it's not conveyed to the court, but listen, this guy is a pedophile. This guy has a huge risk of, of reoffending because of this assessment we've done. So the crime might seem relatively minor ish. And again, I'm just comparing that to a murder. But we know what this person's potential to do and to get up to later. And the court isn't hearing valuable information that can at least guide them into what they should say should happen when they're in prison uh, or how long they should go to prison for. That's a massive, 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 massive gap. And um, I I don't know how they'd overcome it because it would require a lot of money, a lot of psychologists. Um, It would be, I don't know how they'd fix it, but it is a huge gap. And we saw it in the times where we in the unit did give that evidence. It was really, really helpful for the courts because often the courts seem to focus on, did he show remorse? And that's their bench, even parole. I mean, I, I was quite shocked and horrified the other day to hear that Donovan Moodley, that kidnapped and murdered Lee Matthews, is was had us actually without Lee Matthews' parents even knowing, they started the parole hearing without their involvement, which is an issue on its own. But the, the, the panel was focused so much on, but is he remorseful? But remorse 
really doesn't tell you much because you can get a lot of people who do very bad things and feel very terrible about it, but they will do it again next weekend. You know, intimate partner violence is a good example. Uh, cheating on your wife, you know, you might feel very guilty the next day, but you're doing it again two weeks later. So remorse does not, is not your benchmark for determining whether someone is a risk to society. And that's why I think courts, they seem to focus a lot of, on it at sentencing and parole boards seem to focus a lot on the issue of remorse. And it's, they're just really looking in the wrong places to determine someone's risk to society. I think that this is such an important insight, especially since our level of reoffending is so high in this country and there's so much discussion about the parole system. Well, one good example of that, you know, we have had, for example, someone who was charged with possession of child pornography, which on its own, you might not even get a jail sentence, uh, although technically you should for each, for each picture. And now the court says, well, look, these are just pictures. Well, no, the reason why you have child pornography in your computer is because you are a pedophile. And that it means you are a huge danger for reoffending uh, because you've now participated in an industry that abuses children to get those photographs created, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're just looking at it, but this was just a picture, I mean, no harm done really, then I think you're really going to miss out that this person is a huge danger to children because I can almost guarantee you, if you've got those pictures, you're going to be a pedophile and the research supports that, which means you are a risk for reoffending. But what are we doing in, in when we give this guy correctional supervision or when we give, release him on parole to try and put mechanisms in place that they don't go out there and do things that they shouldn't. But if you just look at it as, well, you just had child porn, what's the harm in that, so to speak? You know, you're totally missing the, the plot as to, but what is the reason they had it in the first place? I cannot agree with this message enough. Remorse really is not a good indicator of the probability of reoffending. It's not even a great indicator, in my opinion at least, of whether the person actually experiences any regret, because that notion means something different to everyone. As for a person being arrested for being in possession of child abuse material, that should definitely be a red flag. I think perhaps it should also be a red flag in our homes. And again, this is just my opinion. But if you discover that someone close to you, whether male or female, is viewing pornography that depicts any form of abuse, where consent is taken away from the person being depicted, no matter the age of the person, I think it needs to be seen as a sign of possible deeper issues. Gerard, I must tell you that I found the information you provided about your experiences in the SAPS very enlightening. I don't think that many people realise how some of the changes that were made in the past really have impacted the police service significantly. I've had some ex-members of the SAPS tell me that they felt quite vindicated after reading your book, knowing that they weren't the only ones that felt that way at the time. I also really liked that you took the time to mention each of the officers that worked on the cases you discussed by name. I think often the public pin their hopes on members of the police service that have more public profiles and forgets that there are extremely competent members of SAPS that have served for decades and they just happen to not get public recognition. Yeah, I think, I mean, commenting on your first one, the changes in the police, you know, a lot of people out there, you know, they look at the police as if it's just one entity, you know, not realizing there's the, the guys you see in uniform driving around or, or the sort of, you know, um, crime prevention type of people, uniform guys. That's all they do. They don't investigate stuff. They come out to respond, they respond, they react. And then if there's a crime committed, the detective will come and take over that and investigate it and hopefully take it to court. Um, and then you've got your forensics people. So there's, so, I mean, it's such a massive organization with so many different roles and people and groups and that I often kind of get frustrated when people just say the police are useless. And then you ask them what went wrong. No, well, my house is broken into and next one. Well, that's that aspect of what the police do and, and, and who's involved. So, yeah, and a lot of changes, like I mentioned in the book, from the closure of the specialized units, you know, in 2006 that happened during the quarry case, which I mentioned, um, and how that dramatically affected morale. And we lost a lot of members who just went to go into corporate environments um, where they were snapped up because of their expertise. And 
you know, the frustrations of, of regarding chopping and changing of generals and restructuring of the police and having to apply for your jobs again. And all those things would just are like every time they do that, you know, people, and then they have rumors about the pension is going to change. And then you find a whole bunch of people resigning because they want to take out their pension before it gets, you know, disappears. And those types of things, which, you know, just really sap the morale of people and make it difficult for those people to function in an effective way. So that's the, the one thing. And your, what you mentioned now about making sure that a lot of people are mentioned, I mean, there are even more people obviously involved in all of these cases, but one doesn't want to bore the reader with literally this list of hundreds of people who are involved in each case. But I thought it was important, like exactly what the reasons you mentioned, not to, I mean, I didn't solve these cases. I played sometimes a greater or lesser role. Sometimes my unit played a greater or lesser role. But I, you know, if you do read some books that have been written about some well-known policemen, it, it almost comes across as if it's them, them, them. And sometimes is that intentional? Is it that person's goal? Or sometimes I think the media lifts up and it's easier for the media to lift up a person as opposed to a bunch of people. You know, it's less tangible. So, so I think part of the media is to, to blame, but I think also some people with their books could have done more to make it, you know, show that other people really played an important role. And I thought I wanted to do that. I didn't want to be one of those people that everybody criticized, you know, particularly policemen would criticize and say, ah, oh, he makes it sound like he's the hero of the world. So I, I did that. And I mean, a lot of these people were, you know, deserved that. They were my friends who worked with me on these cases. Um, so I did try to, where possible, highlight people. And again, there were a lot more that, that I don't even know about in some of these cases that, that clearly played important roles. And that's often also the forensics people behind the scenes who are essential in helping us get convictions um, that, that don't get that. So I'm, I'm glad if that came across. I'm very happy. Another thing that I think your book highlights that many people don't realize is how much hands-on experience our members of the IPS get as opposed to their counterparts in many other countries. You mentioned that whereas in some other countries they may work on one or two murder cases of a psychologically motivated nature in their career, in South Africa, someone like you, for instance, has worked on hundreds. Why do you think that is? Well, I think firstly, it's just crime rates, you know, um, if I look at my colleagues in, you know, other parts of the world with his profiling um, units, which tend to be more sort of your first world countries, unfortunately, uh, um, the crime rates in a lot of those places where these guys are, are just, it's just very low. So that's the one issue that they're not getting as many cases. And like I said, we, we also worked the whole, whole of South Africa, where often, you know, for example, my colleagues in in Florida who did you do this work basically work just in Florida. The FBI guys would respond nationally. Uh, they were based in one place, just out of Quantico in Virginia, but they would respond throughout the whole of the U.S. So of course they they would also have a lot of experience. But often they're op they're operating in a fairly fairly small geographical area. I mean, the the guy who used to be for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department would obviously just be covering Los Angeles. So it's partly that that we had a big jurisdictional area. We had more of a say that we had to get involved, um, whereas the FBI, for example, has to be invited in to any case. Um, they can't insist that they're gonna get their heads, their noses stuck in, specifically the profilers. Whereas we could actually, you know, we could hear about something and, and we would go there and get involved and get very intimately involved as you see in the book in some cases. And again, it just, I think our, our overall crime rate uh, is just much higher for all these crimes, which again, gets us a lot of experience. It's important to note what Gerard says there when we malign our progress on criminal investigation in South Africa. It is mostly only first world countries that even have IPS-like units. So the very fact that we have such a unit makes us quite unique and advanced in that respect. Yeah, I mean, if you think of it, the most, most law enforcement agencies throughout the world don't have an IPS type of unit. It's not the common thing. It's not the daily st stock standard for big law enforcement agencies in the US even to have this kind of a service. So just that alone places SAPs further ahead than uh, you know, a lot of other countries. I must admit that I was really surprised by how much work on the ground you and your colleagues did with actually staking out scenes and the like. It's probably naive of me, but I think that many people probably think that the IPS is more a hands-off, paperwork-based type unit, but that's clearly not the case. Yeah, I mean, our setup allowed that. You know, in, even in, the, in some parts of the world, people doing this work are actually civilian employed, not law enforcement members. Even though they're working for a law enforcement agency, 
And because they're employed as civilians, they're not allowed, they don't have the policing powers that a law enforcement person would have. So often they're kept away from the crime scene, the autopsy, interviewing suspects because they're not law enforcement. Whereas we were employed in terms of the police act, we had police ranks, we had uniforms, we didn't wear them though, because we obviously were the type of work we did, but the, there was nothing blocking us from literally from crime scene to courtroom getting involved. So yeah, I mean, we, the fun stuff is going out there. We all love being out in the field, you know, whether it's going out to do a helping with an arrest, um, searching a place, interviewing. I mean, that's really where the fun stuff is. And yes, our, our setup actually allowed for that, which was really, really great compared to to sort of other other countries where they get involved in this type of work. I know that the IPS doesn't just work on serial murder cases. How often and at what stage would they be asked to assist in single murder cases or serial rapist cases? A lot of the time, um, you know, there was always serial murder cases going on that, that would be varying degrees of, of active. So let me put it that way, you know, somewhere we haven't caught the guy, but there's been nothing new for the past, you know, week or two or month or some that are awaiting trial. But no, a lot of our work, I mean, I mean, as I think I worked on over 300 rape series in my time there. Countless individual murders from multi murders to intimate partner murders because there was something unique about them to, um, you know, a lot of child pedophile cases, child pornography cases, um, multi murder cases. Sure. I mean, anything that was weird, we, we would often, you know, even if we got involved in terrorism cases and threat assessment cases for stalking. So now we really got a lot of exposure to a wide range of work, although the unit originally was started because of the serial murder sort of pandemic, if you can put it that way, we had around the mid-90s. In the book, you discuss the differences between serial murder cases in South Africa as opposed to other countries. And although I don't want to elaborate on all the reasons... I did want to ask about the mention you made of the number of sex workers as victims in South African serial murder cases, and how it's far lower than most other countries. Do we have any idea why this is? Look, my personal view on it, for example, in the United States, if you were to walk up to someone and say, hey, get in my car, they would probably say no. <laughs> and if they say, hey, I've got a job for you, don't you, don't you want to get in my car? They'd probably also say no. Um, so how do you get a stranger who perhaps you would think that the police or people won't miss uh, to get in your car and go somewhere with you to a dark, quiet place, sex worker. In South Africa, again, because of our such high rates of unemployment and desperation, to walk up to a lady in the streets, you know, if you're in downtown Johannesburg and say, hey, uh, are you looking for a job? Are you looking for a job? Um, you are, well, I've got a job as a, as, a, as a helper or as a cashier. Are you interested? Yes, and you know it, that's where the majority of serial murderers and, and serial rapists and stuff get their victims. They approach a random stranger on the street and, and offer them a job, and that person will either go with them straight away because they're so desperate, or they'll arrange to meet the following day. And you'll say, "Look, bring your ID, bring your CV, and I'll meet you here tomorrow uh, at ten o'clock." And that's where they get their victims. That I mean, if I tell that to my colleagues in the Netherlands, for example, they say, "But but why why are they going somewhere with a stranger? That's that's why would anybody do that?" And again, it's the economics of crime. To be honest with you, um, if we had a, a high rate of employment, we wouldn't be doing using that modus operandi. It'd be very difficult. Isn't it just fascinating how the socioeconomic background sort of bleeds into so many other aspects of life? Usually when we think about linkages between crime and unemployment, it's from the perspective of unemployed people committing crimes to survive. But here we have a completely different consequence. Gerard also discusses other fascinating differences between South African serial offenders and their international counterparts in the book. In the book, you refer to a case of the youngest serial killer in South Africa, I know that you cannot name the offender because he was a minor at the time of his initial crimes. But do you perhaps know what happened to him after he served his sentence? No, I haven't followed up. And that's you know, one of the sad things that we often were so busy with cases that to do follow-ups afterwards, even going back to interview the guys after conviction to see if they'll tell us something different, which is what you saw, for example, in Mindhunter on Netflix, we never really had the time to do that. We always had so much stuff that we've got to try and get to that, you know, you have to decide we have limited resources. Because remember, for many years, it was really three of us. I mean, when I joined, it was three of us in the unit. I was the only psychologist, and it was Elmery and, and uh, Captain Lynn Evans. 
And then a couple of years later, we got, you know, Colonel Jan DeLonge was mentioned in the book. And then a couple of years later, we got one psychologist, uh, another detective, and Leonard left by that point. So, you know, when you had three, four people um, and you're covering the whole country, we had to kind of look at where, where's our priority and our priorities are always unsolved cases. When you read the book, you'll read about this case. And I must say that it really piqued my interest as a combination of a really young offender and serial murders. Gerard, I think you did a great job of selecting some unexpected cases for discussion in the book. And of course, they were also all cases that highlighted very important points. In the De Silva case, you mentioned that when Superintendent Leone Russ attended the scene of the victim found on the N14, she immediately knew that this was not an ordinary murder scene. Do you know what it was about the scene that gave her this sense? Look, I think it was just the, the pure location. It's literally right on the edge of that busy, busy highway, a naked female lying pretty much face down, if I recall correctly. It was just, you know, we don't see that. Um, even in my career after that, I don't ever recall a body being found in that condition. So she just knew that this is not, you know, this is not your normal. You know, it just, so it was more the location of where that body was found. Um, and that the fact that the, her head had been bludgeoned, you know, with what looked obviously like a heavy instrument, like an axe when they were at the crime scene. And that I think was the key issue to say, okay, this is something beyond our normal, you know, domestic murder, um, robbery murder, uh, what we are seeing here, you know, transporting a body to the middle of a highway and then not even hiding her. You take all that effort, but you don't hide her. So there's something more to it. Um, and Leone just, I mean, was had a history of getting involved in very, very inter interesting cases. Um, and she, yeah, so she was, and she was actually one of the people that was part of the panel that interviewed me for the post. Yeah, when I actually applied for the job. So, and she's since then been, done a lot of great work with, you know, um, trying to get cold case squads set up. She's now in charge of the Victim Identification Center. You know, she's always played a big role with Interpol in victim identification. So, uh, so always was a great supporter of us, and I really appreciated her and people getting us involved in cases. I cover a lot of missing person cases, and it always frustrates me that we don't seem to have the same type of systems set up to identify so-called Jane or John Doe's that other countries appear to have. And as a result, so many unidentified bodies seem to be buried while missing person cases go unsolved. So I was very interested to hear you mention that if an unidentified body is found, the victim's fingerprints might be run through the Home Affairs database. Is this something that is common practice? So every body that's, every body that is found um, unidentified will obviously go to the mortuary if it if it's, appears to be an unnatural death. So what happens then, of course, the first step is to try and identify the victim so you can notify the family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what I've actually just been doing some research at the Johannesburg mortuary, which is the biggest mortuary in, and busiest mortuary in South Africa. And um, I was actually quite surprised that almost all the bodies do actually get identified, a lot more than I thought. It's a small percentage of bodies that don't get identified uh, of the ones that land up at the mortuary. So I was pleasantly surprised. But yes, yeah, so the first task, and it actually is still the police's task, to come and then take fingerprints of all unidentified bodies. Then they put that through the Home Affairs database to try and identify who that person might be. And then, of course, then hope, you know, I hope you then figure out who it is and then contact next of kin to that they can come out and identify the body. But a lot of families, when they can't find their family, they actually start to go to more trees and, and say, look, you know, we've well, son, he's, between 20, he's 25 years old, uh, adult white male, or black male, female. Um, have you had any bodies like that come in recently? So that's also a, quite, a, quite a way in which bodies get identified. Family members going looking at mortuaries for, for family. I was really surprised that we do this. I had no idea. And of course, it makes complete sense. It's also really reassuring to hear that, at least at the Johannesburg mortuary where Gerard was conducting research, the large majority of unidentified bodies do get identified. I must also say that I really like that you pointed out how we like to attach labels to offenders so that we can pretend that they're not just the guy next door. I think it's so true and it's actually really unhelpful because it stops people that could possibly be helped before they commit a crime from being identified. 
And it also creates the separation and perpetuation of the myth that these offenders are somehow differently human than the so-called rest of us. Yeah, and that's back, you know, our earlier discussion today about, you know, serial murderers, even themselves, don't spend the majority of their life killing and carrying on doing bad things. Um, and yes, it is easier if we can say this person's a psychopath, this person is a serial killer, he's a schizophrenic or whatever kind of term you want to use to make them to make them part of the other crowd as opposed to us. You know, it's not me, I couldn't do that. You know, that person did it because they're schizophrenic or whatever, you know, label you want to you know, throw onto the person. And that in a way just makes us feel better that there's some difference with these people, that they're not, this couldn't be me, this couldn't be my husband, this couldn't be my neighbor. Um, it makes us feel, I suppose, falsely safe. And that also brings me to a very important point that you made about how people think that because a crime is psychologically motivated, that it somehow means there must be some form of mental illness involved. And of course, more often than not, that's not the case. Yeah, and I mean, I actually didn't even really think of it that way until once uh, a defense counsel said to me, but yes, there is. you are saying that there's something wrong with my client, because you're saying this is a psychologically motivated crime. And I realized what he was saying is he heard the word psychology, therefore he's thinking lack of criminal capacity, he's not therefore accountable. And I kind of said, no, no, no. I mean, we, uh, psychology influences everything we do. It influences why you decided to start up a podcast, you know, on true crime. It influences why... I chose a particular girlfriend um, or why I like this sport versus that TV program. You know, so our psychology of the individual is influences everything about who we are and the decisions we make. But essentially what we, why we started to use the term psychologically motivated was just to say where most crimes that are committed that the police investigate, there's a financial link somewhere. You know, that housebreaking is because they want items of value. The car hijacking, the bank robbery, the CIT robbery, fraud, uh, you name it, it's typically because there's a, there's a value attached to something in that process that they're going to be getting. Whereas these crimes are motivated not by that external reward that's dragging you towards it, but by what I get by committing the crime or the internal satisfaction I get uh, by committing the crime. And I mean, that ranges from domestic violence. Um, you know, there's no financial benefit for, for beating up your wife or beating up your husband. It's just some kind of in a desire to do so. And it's the same with serial murder. It's the same with Muti murder. There's, there's not really that financial side to it. It's motivated by your thoughts, your ideals, your fantasies. And that's what we would really were trying to say. And, and very often, like I said, the majority of our people who committed these crimes that we used to get in, involved in, in investigation, the overwhelming majority were found fit to stand trial. Even, even some like the Brighton Beach serial murderer who I discussed in the book, who had a documented history of schizophrenia, was ultimately found fit to stand trial because I said what he did was not related to his schizophrenia. And it's not to say that he's normal. He's just not, say, mentally ill. You know, it's, he's not doing this because the voices in his head told him to do it or because he's bipolar, you know. But so he's not the same as you and I, of course, but he knew what he was doing. We're not sure why he did it, but he knows what he's doing and he knows it's wrong and he just doesn't really care necessarily and, and is responsible for his actions. Can you tell us a bit about the work that you do now? Sure. So, you know, obviously in the police, all the work we did pretty much was reactive. You know, the victim had been hurt, raped, murdered, you know, molested, etc. And, you know, even when we catch the guys, got them convicted, it was almost like a fleeting satisfaction, you know, because you haven't fixed anything. You know, you've got a, one of our members of our society sitting in prison, another one, for example, dead. You know, is that really a win-win? And we did over the years start to get more and more involved in assessing threats. In other words, before something has happened, but there's concern that something might happen. And we also started to get contacted by, for example, the security teams of CEOs of big corporations saying, listen, you know, our CEO got these weird emails. Uh, we, you know, can you guys look at them and profile the person? And really what they actually were asking is, can you tell us, you know, how, how worried should they be that something might happen to the CEO of their company and who, of course, could be responsible and what is the way forward and how do we make the stop? And I really like that. And we really got some great training from some of the world's leading experts in threat assessment. And so when I left, I realized there's not a really a, a, a career line for private profilers. Uh, you know, the police aren't going to use you. Private investigators don't really get involved in these cases. And even if they did, they're not really want to bring you into it because it's going to increase costs and people might then not use them and use you instead. So there's not really a market for private profilers um, in the sense of the work I was doing in the police. But there is, there was definitely a gap in terms of 
what we saw for, for companies dealing with workplace violence, which ranges anything from a customer who shouts and threatens one of your staff to someone sending death threats to the CEO of the company, to staff on staff problematic behavior, uh, to being concerned about an active shooter in the workplace. And if you are working with companies who are focused on this, you're, you're actually picking up things at the early phases where there's a concern, you're assessing it, and you're developing a strategy of how they can make that concern not actually realize and materialize. And I like that because it's preventative. Um, and I like corporates because, of course, you get paid corporate rates, which is very nice. <laughs> Having worked in the police and getting exactly the same salary as any other person on my rank. I mean, the fact that I had six degrees, I didn't get any more salary than uh, a brigadier who had a matric. Uh, it is nice to kind of work um, in the corporate space where you, you do get, you know, appropriately rewarded for your input and your contribution. It has its own stresses, of course. And I really, so I like the cases and it's phenomenal what businesses are dealing with in, in the workplace. So I found the cases fascinating and it was preventative and, you know, good payment, to put it very plainly. Um, and it's still something that I find really just it engages me and I get excited when we consult on a case. And, and it does allow you just to have a bit more of a, a lifestyle where I can, you know, I can go to the gym in the morning. I can take the dog for a walk. I can take it easy. And if I want to work at night instead of during the day, I have that flexibility. And, you know, the police didn't offer you that kind of a luxury. And I, I still will get involved in criminal cases from time to time. Look, I mean, my colleagues often just ask my thoughts on a case they're working on, and I'm always happy to share that. And I've always said I'm happy to help train the new people in the unit. And I'm always happy to, you know, spend some time consulting on a case. The, the police as a structure hasn't taken me up on that offer, although some individuals have, you know, will discuss a case with me here and then. But I have done, I do do some court work still whether that's testifying sometimes on the request of the prosecution to do a sentencing report, like we spoke about a bit earlier about those types of reports, or, uh, you know, often for the defense saying, look, we'd like a report for our clients so that we can convey to the court whether or not he's a danger and what to do with that. And, you know, as long as you're doing an honest job and you're giving your honest opinion, you know, that's, it's fine. And I think you're, help, you're helping the court make a good decision, which is in everybody's benefit. Uh, so I will still do a bit of court work in that regard, but it's definitely not the majority of what I do. It's more mine is the sort of workplace violence stuff. I am so glad that Gerard has managed to find a niche that still puts his incredible skills to good use. And coming from a corporate space myself, I really do think that the work he does now is hugely beneficial and necessary. And I hope the business only goes from strength to strength. As I mentioned in the beginning, I was able to fit in a few listener questions, which Gerard kindly answered for us. Here they are. Monica Jane Boerter would like to know, why do children kill? What motivates them and where do things go wrong? Thanks, Monica Jane. So why do children kill? It's a a very difficult one to answer. You know, we, we definitely don't have the majority of our murders been committed by, you know, kids under eight, under the age of 18, and less so, you know, kids under the age of 12, 10, etc. So it's, I think it's a whole field of, of murder that we don't really understand very well, because there's not lots of them to study. Yes, I think you do get some which are the, the classic early psychopaths that, for whatever reason, uh, have, have murdered someone. Um, we've had, you know, some of our family murders being committed by people quite young. So that's one area where I think you could, we've seen it I wouldn't say with regularity because family murder is still off quite rare, but where we have seen that the family murder suspect is someone, you know, who's, who's fairly young, but there's going to be like, it's like with any murder, there's so many different potential motives, anger, hatred, something got out of hand to a, just a very bad person who wants to have some secondary benefit of getting rid of this individual, you know, inheriting money, whatever the case may be. So Difficult question to answer. Uh, and I do think in South Africa, we have a great shortage of us actually studying crime. And I don't think we have a culture of us funding research for people to go out and do these really interesting studies where we go and interview a whole bunch of these people, get get 100 child murderers who killed, you know, X type of people and study them, go interview them, speak with them and, and kind of get up, build up a profile about these types of kids. Knesset Kruger would like to know if many of these serial murderers showed symptoms of conduct disorders as children, as in the case of Stuart Wilkin. Hi, Knesset. So, no, you know, that's one of the things I realized. There's no one clear pathway to becoming a serial murderer. We've, we've just found that they have such very different divergent backgrounds. You had someone like Stuart Wilkin who had a very 
traumatic, horrible upbringing. And that was pretty much confirmed by alternative sources that that was his horrific upbringing. And then we've had people like, for example, Kova Seldenes, the Norwood serial murder, who had a very normal upbringing. His parents were married up until, you know, one of them passed away. Nothing that stood out in his childhood behavior. Um, really kind of a, just a very plain, boring childhood. So there's no clear, clear pathway. So, you know, people used to speak about that McDonald triad of bed wetting, fire setting, cruelty to animals, and that's kind of been dispelled long ago. Of course, yes, if you have a child who is setting fire to animals or hurting animals or setting fire to anything, that is worthy of them being brought to the attention of a psychologist because they probably have issues, not to say they're going to go out and kill people one day. So there's nothing, and I almost kind of got to the point where I said, you know, I've given up trying to figure out why people become serial murderers and was just focusing on how do we catch them quicker because there isn't one nice, beautiful pathway. That would make life very easy because we would be able to identify them early on and hopefully intervene and get them off that pathway. Melanie Skuman would like to know which criminal mind that you dealt with in your career disturbed you the most and why? Sure. You know, I often kind of get asked that or a variation of that, you know, which is the case that stands out the most. Um, I don't know if I ever was really disturbed. Um, I think because I always looked at it from the point of a clinical psychologist and I found human behavior fascinating. So to be honest with you, the more strange, the more I found it fascinating. So someone like Stuart Wilkin, you know, who had this really traumatic upbringing and he had such a wide range of behavior in his murder series and victimology and, you know, from cannibalism to necrophilia to, you know, children to adults to strangulation to stabbing to evisceration. It was just really, I think that was perhaps the most fascinating for me, which perhaps I could translate into the answer of your question, which was you say was most disturbing. Well, perhaps if I use my word fascination and your word disturbing and use them as a synonym, I would probably say Stuart. And then I got to interview him over two days in 2006, long after he was convicted. Um, and that was really just amazing. Um, you know, there, are other, there were others like, you know, the Modi Morley serial murderer, which isn't discussed in this book, who was also killing children up in Modi Morley, the old Nelstrom. And when I interviewed him, you know, just, I suppose, just his casual way in which he spoke about raping and killing his kids was that, uh, that struck me that he would almost be looking at his nails while he's talking about, you know, how he did one, two, and three towards these little innocent children. And, you know, that the fact that just someone with, could, with absolutely any absence of any regret, remorse, anything, just uh, be speaking about these things as if it's sort of, you know, talking about the weather. It was such a huge honor and pleasure to interview Gerard Labaskachny. If you don't already have your copy of The Profiler Diaries, I highly recommend you go out and get it. If you aren't already listening to Gerard's podcast with journalist Paul Llewellyn called Profiler Africa, I also highly recommend you go and listen to that. They'll be on all of the platforms that you use to listen to True Crime South Africa. I do hope that you enjoyed my interview with Gerard and that you gained as many great insights from it as I did. If you did enjoy this interview, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the platform you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And keep your eye out for those sneaky, if you were stuck in an elevator with questions, to have your question featured in future interviews. I'll be back next Friday with a new episode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. Bye.